all of you for the work that you do uh, with the free press and uh, with other uh, points of interest around the city and um, in your own circles. It's a uh, nice one we can uh, break bread and show each other uh, kindness and love and respect amongst each other. And that creates space for uh, greater ideas to, to flourish and, uh, and prosper. So it's wonderful for all of us to be aligned in that respect as we uh, move into the holiday season. Um, so uh, I'm not certain who the first speaker was. Uh, but I will pass the buck to Mr. Mark Sandberg. He's going to introduce some of our speakers. And uh, later on, we'll have some nice jazz for you. And uh, thank you all for being here. I hope, I hope Chris uh, introduced himself. Chris Appleton is a longtime friend of Old Purse and many other things. And Gerard and he have been doing some sort of exciting. Have been hearing some exciting, some exciting musical efforts here in in, in the church, and so uh, we're sort of exploring with going with the free press salon around the city, around the city, and sort of uh, wanting to, and we wanted to definitely have old first part of that because. Uh, We've had some relationships with that over the years. Uh, this season, this uh, this this salon tonight uh, theme is what's today, December tenth. What's today? Yeah. Human, Human rights. rights Day. Human Rights Day today. Uh, right after the World War Two. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it is working. Good job. Thanks. So. Brian has has it on and it's working. So the live is feed is reading. Um, so good. So uh, today in 1940, what was it? 48. Yeah, 1948. I'm just doing some checking on some people. 1948, December 10th, the Human Rights Day was declared. The Universal Declaration was passed by the United Nations um, and was put in force. Meaning human rights is the law of the universe, or not the universe, but the, 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 the world right here, right? Well, we don't know how the Martians are doing their thing. And all the, other um, the United States is a critical player in that as well. So, but is it real? Is the human rights uh, declaration uh, impactful on people's lives? Uh, we want to explore that a little bit tonight. So we have, we're blessed to have a few folks that want to speak on human rights. And uh, Lorraine Moore is going to be our first one. She's going to give us sort of an overview. She's written a lot on the Human Rights Declaration and, and has, has uh, experiences uh, uh, speaking about it and, and being with, with um, people in community. And, and, and hopefully she, she will uh, give us a good wide view you know, that 10,000 uh, foot view of what human rights is, and then we're going to get down into the nitty gritty and start talking about a little bit what that means for us here in Columbus, but also around the world. Um, so Lorraine, are you ready to go? No, I'm introducing. Yeah, Joe's going to introduce you. So Joe Keener is part of uh, 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 the Baha'i Faith, and, uh, and I'll let, and, and he also helps with uh, Four Seasons City Farms, so his relationship here with Old First is very important as well. So uh, Joe, I want you to come on up and, and start talking. We do, please, you do have food in the other room. We're gonna be outside with uh, bonfires. We're gonna have s'mores if you're wanting to do that. Um, eat eat and, and have fun. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, Christopher reminded me, which I reminded him, and he didn't do it, and I didn't do it either. Um, we are needing to support Old First. So if you have any, like a nickel in your, in your, in your pocket, or maybe a thousand dollars, whatever, <laughs> uh, put it in the bucket down here, that would be great. Uh, so Joe Keener, please, um, yeah, bucket right there, and buckets up there. We got plenty of buckets. That's so. for the musicians. That's for the musicians down here. So we do have two. 
uh, uh, aspects that we're going to do. And again, Gerard and uh, but uh, thank you. And so here, Joe, we're going to start it up. I don't know if I need, can you hear me without a microphone? Yeah. I will, um, oh, okay. Because you're Zooming in. Yeah. I guess it's being Zoomed to uh, other folks that aren't here tonight. Um, I want to introduce my friend Lorraine. Um, she doesn't like big fancy introductions, so I'm going to actually introduce her with the song. But I'll say if you, I've known her for like at least 20 years. I don't remember when we first met. She said it was probably in Mansfield when I was singing in the park, but, um, Lorraine uh, officially has a, a master's degree in conflict-free conflict resolution, which is an amazing thing and uh, something that in the world today is is, duly, is really needed because there's a lot of conflict, but not a lot of um, conflict-free resolution of conflict. Um, she also joined the Peace Corps when she was in her 50s, and she's currently uh, doing diversity training for FEMA. So I'm gonna introduce her with the song. And um, I wrote this song, I can't remember when exactly, but I do remember singing it for a race unity conference in 1982, when my younger son Justice was a baby. And then I added a verse in 1999, when we started, when the Central Ohio Green Education Fund started the uh, Citizens Grassroots Congress, and um, we had a, a all day conference to introduce the idea of the grassroots Congress. And it turns out Lorraine was one of the facilitators of one of the workshops in 1999. So now here we are in 2022, and we're still trying to figure out how to be in the 21st century after having a century where the idea of world peace was slowly introduced and we've kind of been backsliding, backsliding ever since the turn of the century. I don't want to get into that because that's political. <laughs> So this is my song and I want to introduce Lorraine with it. I'm going to sing it a cappella because I think a good song can stand alone without accompaniment and with hearing aids and arthritis it's getting harder and harder to, to fiddle with a ukulele or a guitar. So here goes. I stand in the garden of humanity and recognize the richness of you and me while celebrating our diversity. I work for the flowering of unity. I look at a budding world community and see the spreading roots of solidarity. I hear a song that will set people free to all dance together in harmony. And what about in your backyard? Go talk to your neighbors and make a plan to nurture each other and take care of the land. If we dance together, one thing I know, an eco-revolution will surely grow. We'll see the greening of community with equity and justice and sustainability. So sing a song that will let you and me be united together as one family. I look at a budding world community and see the spreading roots of solidarity. So sing along a song that will set the whole world free to all come together as one, to all live together as birds of a feather in any kind of weather in peace. So why do you sing along the next part? Because you know the tune. We shall live in peace, all the words will sing in this. We shall live in peace. Well, anyway, you know the song, and I want you to sing it in your hearts as you listen to Lorraine, how we can all overcome our prejudices and everything else that's holding us back from bringing about world peace. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe.
We'll use this for music later. Addie Mae Collins, 14 years old. Cynthia Wesley, 14 years old. Carol Robertson, 14 years old. Carol Denise McNair, 11 years old. Sunday, September 15, 1963. The 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed by domestic terrorists. Three white supremacists killing the four children I just named and seriously injuring 20 or more. This while all preparing for Sunday school. Martin Luther King has described the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church as one of the most vicious and tragic crimes ever perpetrated against humanity. Just a note, those terrorists were only arrested in 2020, 58 years after that crime. My name is Lorraine Williams, Lorraine Moore. I am the daughter of Jimmy and Isabella. My dad died uh, some years ago, but my mom is 102 today and still striving. I was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama during the civil rights movement. I am a product of the civil rights movement. Everything that I do today, everything that I have done was with intention, is with intention, and it has been since being raised in Birmingham, Alabama during the civil rights movement. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, how many of us have heard of that? That's unusual. It really is unusual because such a document with such intention has never really been enforced. never been enforced. It has never been enforced. Every now and then you'll hear something about universal declaration from the United Nations. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background on that and tell you uh, basically how this, this document cannot be spoken about without talking about social justice and without, without talking about the oneness of humanity. What that really means. What are the implications of such a document? How many articles does the uh, universe, uh, does the um, Human Rights, Declaration of Human Rights have? Anybody can tell me? 30. 30, 30. Somebody's been studying. It matters to some. It's really a beautiful document, really put, to, uh, put together very well. So the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights is a milestone document in history, in the history of human rights. It was drafted by representatives with different legal and cultural backgrounds from all regions of the world. Now that's amazing. And it was proclaimed by the United Nations General Assem Assembly in Paris, December 10th, 1948. And it was put together as a common standard of achievements for all people in all nations. And it sets out for the first time 
fundamental human rights to be universally protected, and it has been translated into over 500 languages. So what really is the, the Declaration of Human Rights? And why was it put into practice? Can anybody tell me? Who said it? After World War II, the atrocities that took place, uh, the United Nations and the international com community vowed that nothing of this type would ever happen again. So with that, the world leaders decided to complement the United Nations Charter with a roadmap to guarantee the rights of every individual everywhere. So this document that they drafted was really important. Uh, can anybody tell me who was involved? Who? Eleanor Roosevelt, hey, that was really great because I that was one of the things that stood out for me. Uh, plus, there were women delegates from various countries, and they played a key role. But dear sister Eleanor, she was the first lady of the United States. Anybody know when? What date that was? What date she was the first lady? To Give that man a green jelly bean. <laughs> Excellent. She was appointed in 1946 as a delegate to the United Nations General Assembly by the United States President at the time, Harry S. Truman. And she served as the first chairperson of that commission uh, on human rights and played an instrumental role in drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that was at a time when increasing tensions were between the East and the West. And Eleanor Roosevelt, and I really respect her and really like her for the work that she has done. She used her prestige and credibility with both superpowers, the East and the West to steer the drafting process towards its successful completion. In 1978, she was recognized for that. And you can't, like I said, you can't talk much about the Declaration of Human Rights unless you include uh, the wonders of humanity. Can anybody think of anything where the wonders of humanity might have implications? with this document, with human rights, and with everything else. Anybody want to give a stab? What does wonders of humanity mean? The arts. Excuse me? The arts. The arts, OK. We're all connected. We're all connected. We all come in naked and we all leave naked. It does mean a lot. What else? Excuse me? Okay, injury of one is injury of all. Can anybody, you want to explain it in another way? What does that really mean? We agree. What else? Seeing each other as integral and related, acknowledging the fact that it's only less than 1% of our DNA makes us look different. We're all at least a 50th cousin to everyone else on the planet. If we embrace that idea that that everyone is part of our extended family, we're going to treat people better. And a lot of people in our society are trash. And if you look at some of the, the latter um, articles in the, in the um, Universal Declaration, there's things like uh, the right to food, water, loving parents, education, and health care. 
And a lot of these things we're still thinking of as commodities instead of human rights that everyone deserves. And you hear this stuff going on about, well, you got to work for what you get. Are we making babies starve because they can't contribute to the economy of their family? Everyone is part of a family and needs to have their needs taken care of. And that, to me, is part of it. And it probably includes, at some point, some notion of global federation. Because okay. you have to codify stuff because some people don't naturally want to come to their uh, innate altruism unless any of us stop. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. But that's just, just just one part of it. And when we talk about oneness of humanity, we it sounds simple, right? We love one another. Okay, is love enough? There are countless dimensions to the oneness of humanity. Joe just mentioned a few of those. But we can go on and on and on. Every human being here was created in the spirit of God. But sometimes we forget. God gave each person a soul. Which has no gender. No race. No ethnicity. No social class. Do we, do we believe that the world will transcend the boundaries between nations, races, ethnicities, and unite? Well, Go ahead, Joe. To me, it's a, actually, it's part of evolution. We went from being, being living in family tribal groups, and at some point, probably with the introduction of agriculture, we were able to develop city states. So those individual families were able to come together, federated into a city. Cities started to interact and we had the notion of nationhood. And now with technology and um, advances in communication, it's hard to ignore the fact that we are one planet. Uh, they just landed uh, you know, a vehicle on the moon or and they're talking about having some people back on the moon again. You know, when they had the first la moon landing, um, people saw that blue jewel in the heavens and they realized, oh, we're all one planet. And so to me, it's inevitability that at some point we're gonna have to um, acknowledge that unity. And, and um, anyway, I don't wanna, I, I could talk about it for a long time. And, and and probably the spiritual component, whether you're religious or not, is a is a big factor because if you're going to embrace the oneness of humanity, you have to go beyond a slogan and make it part of um, who you are and, and get it from your brain into your heart. Because it's really hard to manage the shaman's style about if you want to manifest something, you got to get it from your head into your heart and put energy the, the energy of the your energy behind it. You would think somebody, you read my notes. Pardon? Because you, I would think that you read my notes. I'm sorry. No, because the one is humanity, the implications are great for, for the world at large. It means treating people the way you want to be treated. That's what it means. If there's something, uh, the young lady over here said the injury of one is the injury of all. She's talking about each person as the body politic. Everybody's involved. So if the hand suffers, let's say the hand is severed. If you sever your hand, if you're part of one body politic, your whole body is going to, uh, is going to be affected by that. So if something happens here, if something happens in Timbuktu, Africa, where it affects the world body, body politic, then eventually we're all going to feel the implications of that pain. We don't look at it that way, but we need to start looking at it that way. The Baha'i teachings talk about proclaim the oneness of humanity and the oneness of the world itself. 
There are periods and stages in the life of the aggregate world of, hum of humanity, which at one time was passing through its degree of childhood, at another its time of youth, but now has entered its long presaged period of maturity. The evidences of which are everywhere visible and apparent. Therefore, the requirements and conditions, conditions of former periods have changed and merged into exigencies which distinctly characterize the present age of the world of mankind. That which was applicable to human needs during the early history of the race could neither meet nor satisfy the demands of this day and period of newness and consummation. Humanity has emerged from its former degrees of limitation and preliminary training. Man must now become imbued with new virtues and powers, new moralities, new capacities, new bounties, bestowals, and perfections are awaiting and already descending. I just wanted this, you know, he wanted us to take a look at, at this document, but 15 minutes, 20 minutes, can, can really, we can really go for 20 days talking about uh, the Declaration of Human Rights. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. Deal ye with one another with the utmost love and harmony, with friendliness and fellowship. There are no differences or distinctions of race among you in the sight of God. And can we do, can we have any document? As Joe talked about, the Declaration of Human Rights is the head, but we have to connect the heart with the head. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of words on paper. It's an important document, one that we neglected and one that we don't we don't do anything about enforcing it. All of the servants, all, we are all servants of God. And we're all submerged in this ocean of his oneness. Not a single soul is bereft. On the contrary, all of the recipients of the bounties of God, every human creature has a portion of his bestowals and a share of the effulgence of his reality. God is kind to all. Mankind are his sheep, and he is their real shepherd. No other scriptures contain such breadth and universality of statement. No other teachings proclaim the unequivocal, unequivocal principle of the solidarity of humanity. As regards any possible distinctions, therefore such souls must be educated in order that they may be, may be brought to the degree of perfection. Some are sick and ailing. They must be treated and cared for until they are healed. Some are asleep. They need to be awakened. Some are immature as children. They should be helped to attain maturity, but all must be loved and cherished. The child must not be disliked simply because it is a child. Nay, rather, it should be patiently educated. The sick one must not be avoided nor slightly, nor slighted, merely because he is ailing. And to close this up, we're in a stage of maturity where the adulthood of our species can only come about with a new consciousness of the oneness of humanity. And when you talk about consciousness, you're talking about being aware of everything that you're getting ready to do before you do it. You know, we're, we're on automatic pilot. We, we move and work on automatic pilot. But if you're gonna develop a new consciousness, you have to be aware of what your hand is getting ready to do before it does it. We know scientifically that all human beings are cousins related to one another 
through our common African ancestors. Now the proclamation and the time has come for all of us to embrace our commonality, to encourage and recognize our unity, and to make a commitment to act with love and kindness towards the entire human family. Amanda Gorman, you probably heard of her. She spoke uh, at the inauguration and she inspires us to be the light. This poem is like a call to action to everyone to acknowledge where we are and where we came from and to recognize the role we all play. Rise and rebuild for the sake of future generations. She reminds us that while times may be dark, there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. And I know you probably hear things over and over and you've probably heard them over and over uh, at one time or another in your lifetime. But it's time for us to be brave enough to be the light. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights, if you haven't had the opportunity to read through it, I suggest you read through it because all of the things that we've been bringing out today, even in such a short time, those things are contained in that document. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, some of the packet that we were giving out was from the, ninth, the 50th anniversary of the uh, Declaration of Human Rights, okay? From the Declaration of Human Rights. Um, so if you didn't get a, a copy of that, talk to me, we can get it again. But there, there's, there's much resource. The, uh, um, Lorraine mentioned the uh, uh, Roosevelt, Ms. Roosevelt, but the Roosevelt Institute is, and, and, and uh, supports the Human Rights uh, Declaration and has been able to put those things out. So we're gonna move towards some sort of like on the ground now, what we're talking about, that's sort of the overarching discussion of what human rights is. It's universal, it's understood that as humans, you have certain inalienable rights, right? Uh, we talk about them in the United States under a constitution, but um, I wanted to have a few speakers, and then we're going to have some music. Gerard and his folks are get, got it together and are, and are going to be pretty pretty dynamic. We'll have a little conversation of fellowship time. Again, we're, it's our first time being live for a while, so uh, Tecla, do you want to start with the, we're going to start with some political prisoner discussions, a, a discussion, and um, she has some issue uh, on uh, Julian Assange. If you don't know Julian Assange, it's going to be there, there's discussion. And then she has a very personal story that she wants to uh, have us uh, speak to and be part of. Okay, so here's Tecla, longtime friend and supporter of Free Press. Right. And that's a very short talk. Uh, they are protected against cruel and unusual punishment. Well, if you don't think being in prison for 20 years is cruel and unusual punishment, maybe they are protected. Um, they should be afforded a minimum standard of living, food, shelter, and I will tell you that the food is more or less like eating the worst hospital food you can imagine forever, perhaps. Um, prisoners retain some constitutional rights, due process in their right to administrative appeals and a right of access to the parole process. But I can tell you that in Ohio, prisoners have no right to parole whatsoever. They can have a parole hearing, 
but they don't have a right to parole. They don't have a liberty interest in parole. Um, they are protected against unequal treatment on the basis of race, sex, and creed. Uh, a confined person has a protected interest in freedom from discrimination on the basis of race, religion, national origin or sex. They also have rights to speech and religion to the extent that these rights do not interfere with their status as inmates. And you should remember that the 13th Amendment prohibits involuntary servitude and slavery, except in the case of somebody convicted of a crime. So uh, they are in effect slaves. And there are 2 million people in the nation's prisons and jails, which is a 500% increase over the last 40 years. And th this came about through changes in sentencing law and policy, not through changes in crime rates. Uh, with the result that in Ohio, we spend about $0.9 billion a year incarcerating 42,000 people, maybe even closer to 50,000. And this increased hugely uh, starting in 1970. If you look at the graph, I meant to bring the graph, but I didn't. To look at the graph, incarceration rate looks sort of like this, and then, and then starting in 1970. So, so today in the nation's prisons, sorry, the nation's prisons reached 2.2 billion about 2014. And now it is, there has been a somewhat decrease, but there are still 1.6 billion people in prison. There's a slight downward tendency, which is certainly a very good thing. Um, now, they have these various constitutional rights, but how, but what protects them? Well, do the courts protect them? The courts tend to defer to prison officials regarding prisoners' rights. So long as the conditions or degree of a prisoner's confinement are within the sentence and not otherwise violative of the Constitution, the due process clause does not require judicial oversight. When prison regulations infringe on an inmate's constitutional rights, the courts do not apply strict scrutiny. Rather, the rational basis test is used to determine whether the infringement may stand. Uh, so the courts do not defend prisoners' rights very much. Now, my husband is in prison. I married a prisoner in 2002, 20 years ago. And I, I am going to ask you to write a, a letter for him uh, to the parole board asking for his release. So let me tell you about him. He committed a terrible crime. He has been in prison 39 years because of the crime. Well, it's a series of crimes. He went to a party and purchased some amphetamines, even though he was not using, because he wanted to get a date with the young woman that was selling them. But on the way home in a friend's car, the car was stopped by the police. And he said to himself, I better not be caught with these on me in my friend's car. So he swallowed five or six doses of amphetamines. And a day or so later, he went on a five-day crime spree, killing, 
kidnapping six young women who were raped. He stole, uh, sexually fond fondled another. He stole money. He stole jewelry. Uh, he took their cars, and one of them he left a few blocks away, and that is Grand Theft Auto. And the judge uh, piled on all the, uh, every, every possible thing he could as a separate offense. But he did go yes. to the hospital to seek help. Yes. First. Before that. turned them out. That's correct. Before, before the prime spree, he knew something was wrong. He sensed that his head was not right. So he went to a hospital looking for help. And he walked into the hospital and wandered through the corridors till he saw a door that said psychiatry and wandered in and they told him to get out. So in fact, he, he was never seen by anybody in the hospital for help. So in fact, when he went to trial, his attorney, he was assigned an attorney with whom he would not cooperate. He said, I don't want that attorney. I don't want any attorney. I want to defend myself. And the judge, and that, that attorney asked the judge for a competency hearing. So the, prison psycho the state psychologist saw him and declared him mentally ill, said, looks like paranoid schizophrenia, but he won't cooperate. And he is not competent to stand trial. But the judge ignored that, declared him competent to stand trial, and let him defend himself. And I will say that he is full of remorse. Uh, he is, from the beginning, was horrified that he had done such a thing. But of course, that's too late, isn't it? He's been a model prisoner the whole time. What? He's been a model prisoner the whole time. He has been a model prisoner in his 39 years in prison. Uh, he came into prison, Ohio prisons, with a GED. And in prison, he earned a bachelor's degree as well as two associate's degrees. And he has always had helping jobs, and not always. He has often had many, many helping jobs in prison. And currently, he is working for a progressive environmental awareness program written by a professor in the California uh, university system. And this is, it's called Roots of Success. It is designed to teach the real environmental issues to people with low literacy skills. And my husband, Willie, and another inmate were designated the two master trainers. They are the only people in the Ohio prison system that can train another person to teach the course. Well, you can't call it teach because prisoners are not allowed to teach. They can only facilitate. So for 10 years, perhaps, Maybe he has been teaching in this course and, and training other people to do it. And the prison system loves this program because it's a re-entry program and they need to have, need to have re-entry programs. And they love this, this, this program because it doesn't cost them a penny because the inmates teach it. <coughs> so th there is an article 
um, written by Bob, Bob Petrakis. Who's in this house? What? Who's in this house right here? Who is in this house right here? It's called Ohio's Broken Parole System. That's it. And, and it's about the parole system, and it's largely about Willie. So about half of it is about Willie. And there is also an online petition. And that, that article has a reference to the, to the petition. So I hope, I hope all of you will, will go online and sign the petition. But I'd also like to ask you to write a letter for Willie. And I have here a handout that gives the parole board address and mentions some things that you could mention, points that you could mention if you do write a letter. So could somebody pass this around? Thank you. The truth is that Willie is a good person. He really tries very, he has tried very hard to change himself because he was so horrified at what he had done. And I think that within the prison, he is, tries to be a good influence with everybody that he touches. Now, the next issue. Can I ask, can I ask a question? Yes. His sentence was 125 years to 385 years. It's a it's a virtual life sentence. Yes, and I, I I believe that 20 years is enough for any crime, unless while you're in prison you do something horrible. If you have a good prison record, 20 years is plenty. Trump's going to get off with nothing. Of course. <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> and, and really, Willie's prison record is almost perfect. He once, I think there was one, he got a one ticket for violence. And that's because somebody punched him and called him a nigger. And, he, and they got into a fight. You get into a fight, you're responsible whoever started it. That, that's, that's the petition to the parole board. It, it's referenced in the article. And you can find the article by looking for Ohio's pro broken parole system. Or you can come and get the URL from me. At the Columbus Free Press .org. Columbus Free Press .org. Columbus Free Press .org. Or Free Press .org. Or Free Press no, freepress.com. Columbusfreepress.com no. or Columbus or just freepress.org. No. Columbusfreepress.com or freepress.org. Yeah. Now, as to free speech and freedom of the press, what I believe, what I believe is that without freedom of the press, Democracy is not possible. And democracy, because democracy means to me, maybe to you, that anybody affected by a decision ought to have a chance to influence the outcome. And with, without free speech, without freedom of the press, there is no way to influence the outcome of political decisions. And Julian Assange is being persecuted and prosecuted 
because the CIA and the other uh, NSF, FBI, they hate him because he exposed the evil things that they were doing. He's being prosecuted, not because he broke any law, because I don't believe he broke any law. He's being prosecuted because they hate him for exposing their evil deeds. In 1910, 1910, no, let's try that again. In 2010, in 2010, Assange published, published, uh, the collateral murder video. How many of you have seen the collateral murder vi video? Would somebody like to describe it for me? Joy riding with a semi machine gun that's can cut people up into 17 and they're talking about it, just going, doing their thing. Doing it from a helicopter. From a helicopter. Yeah, yeah. And when when medical people came to help, they killed the medical people. Yeah. And Bradley Manning, who became Chelsea Manning, was so dismayed that she provided the video to WikiLeaks and to Julian Assange. And it is truly horrifying. And he and Assange also I'm trying to find my notes and I'm not finding them. Well, I have to be somewhere there. Not that. Thank you. <laughs> um But there are new developments in, in Assange's case. At the end of November, five news, five, the five big world newspapers part, part, partnered with WikiLeaks to publish Manning's material in 2010. And that last week called on the Biden administration to drop the charges on Assange because of the threat to the First Amendment. The Guardian, Le Monde, the New York Times, El País, and Der Spiegel. And that's a big, big change because for years, for, for years, for 10 years, nine years, Assange has been prosecuted and persecuted and imprisoned. Uh, and journalists were not speaking out. So finally, they decided to speak out and complain. And this last week, Daniel Ellsberg, who published the Pen Pentagon Papers. Who knows what the Pentagon Papers are? How would you like to tell the rest? Anybody? Yeah, I, I, already, I already said my number. So. <laughs> Pentagon, anybody? You remember, you remember Vietnam? I lines about the Vietnam War by one of the five key architects who wrote them up. Uh, Ellsberg was very courageous. He copied many, many classified documents and provided them to the press. Uh, and what he did was certainly illegal. And they prosecuted him but they made some kind of an error during the prosecution. And because of they that- They burglarized his psychiatrist's office. And yes. Just why they couldn't really go out. They had to release him because of that. Um, and this last week, Daniel Ellsberg and another publisher, uh, have both requested that they be indicted on the same charges as Assange. And even Rachel Maddow has called for dropping the charges. 
So that's pretty, pretty spectacular change in the last week or so. So thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Tecla. We're going to, uh, so situate yourselves a little bit. We're going to move the speakers over here, and the band is going to start setting up. Uh, so they got about 10 minutes to get set up. So we're going to start setting up our speakers over here. We only got about one or two more. Um, Joe, are you ready to talk? You going to? No? You don't want to? Not at all? Okay. Ben, come on up. We're going to talk. Hey, Yes. Ben, you ready? Okay, Abraham. I know Abraham's always ready. Come on, Bonowitz. Okay, we got uh, the, the, uh, A. Bonowitz is is a, a global hero for uh, trying to end death penalty. And in Ohio, we're getting close. We're getting close. We're getting close. Even Poppy uh, DeWine is sort of start talking about it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you uh, for putting us on tonight. My name is Abe Bonowitz. I live not too far from here. And I just walked in. And the reason I just walked in is because this is not my first Human Rights Day event of the day. And I had to close up another one to get over here. But I wanted to be here tonight to be with you all because it's so important that we gather in these moments and celebrate our victories when we can, lament our shortcomings and commit to doing better. And we have some real opportunities. I mean, I've been doing, as Mark said, uh, work to abolish the death penalty, not only here in Ohio, not only just in this country, but worldwide. And the amazing thing over the course of my 30 years, and I can see I'm one of the younger people in the room here for even longer, you know, it used to be when I first started doing this work, executions were happening in about 70% of the world. And now it's reversed. The death penalty has been abolished in about 70% of the world. It's been abolished. Well, 23 states have abandoned the death penalty, but since I've been working on it, you know, we've all been a part of efforts that have abolished the death penalty in New Jersey, New Mexico, Illinois, Connecticut, Maryland, Nebraska, New Hampshire, uh, Colorado, and even Virginia. Now, in Nebraska, of course, you know, more Republicans voted to abolish the death penalty than Democrats. There were only eight Democrats in that entire body. Nebraska is unicameral. They don't have a Senate. They passed the bill. The governor vetoed it. They overrode the veto. And then the governor put his own money into a ballot initiative, put it on the ballot, and got it reversed, and it executed one person there in Nebraska. But eight states have legislatively repealed the death penalty. And Ohio could be the next. And it's very exciting, very different to have a, and, and not actually entirely different to have a Republican led state ready to abolish death penalty. But that's what's happened. But I also want to share with you, you know, y'all know why we have International Human Rights Day, but this week coming up at the United Nations, every other year, they have a vote to have a moratorium on executions. And there's a whole bunch of other things that are on the agenda to be voted on this coming Thursday by the General Assembly of the United Nations. But among them is this, this, this uh, a resolution to have a moratorium on executions. And, you know, of course, we want to go all the way to abolition, but it is what it is. The difference for us this year is that we have a president who is on record saying he opposes the death penalty. And he gets to appoint the people that represent us at the United Nations. And for the first time, because the United States always votes no on this referendum, standing with Yemen and Iran and Iraq and Saudi Arabia and all of those countries that use the death penalty. And you know, we think we got a bad protesting here in, in, in Ohio and they're making laws to incriminate us for protesting on the streets here in Columbus. In Iran, they just executed the guy for being part of the uprising that's happening there right now. In Egypt, they've executed people for being parts of the uprising. They make up stuff about them to make it a capital crime, but 
uh, in Myanmar. They just executed seven people last week in um, Saudi Arabia. They've executed people for protesting for better human rights against the government, nonviolently. That's the company that we're standing with. And for the first time, we have this opportunity. So I'll tell you something that's amazing. One of the things that's, I mean, y'all, many of you know me, I don't see myself as anything special, but somehow what has been built over the 30 years that I've been working has made me, well, I'll just say, yesterday I got a phone call from Governor O'Malley, former presidential candidate, Governor O'Malley. He is now on the International Commission to Abolish the Death Penalty. And he had asked around, who do I need to talk to to help move the president? And he was directed to me and the organization that I created, Death Penalty Action. So I want to invite you right now, actually, those of you that are on your phones, we already said, the rest of you pull out your phones and go to deathpenaltyaction.org and just scroll down a little bit to see where you get the action to write to the president and ask him to order our representatives to the United Nations to vote yes on the referendum to oppose executions. This is something that we could actually do and have a victory on this year if enough of us stand up. And, and, and it's not just us. It's, I mean, Governor O'Malley is leading this charge. There's going to be a big press conference on Tuesday with all kinds of folks in Urban League and NAACP and all the usual suspects, but also other unusual suspects and everybody like you and me. And that's the thing I want to make sure you all understand. I don't see myself as anything special, but I stood up and I kept doing this work and we've been able to create something with the help of so many of you. And we can make a difference just by showing up. So tonight, I invite you to deathpenaltyaction.org, write to the president. They open up the phone lines on, th on Tuesday, call the president. But we can have a win this week together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, the best the best video I've ever seen in the recent years is, is with Gary Witte and Abraham Bonowitz in a car together going down the road to hit the next anti-death uh, penalty uh, work that they're doing. And it was, it, 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 it's so fun to see, not fun, what's the right word? It's so uh, gratifying to see local people making an international impact. So um, Pat Morito wanted to speak a little bit about some of our successes that we've had some people have talked how crazy or how General Assembly and other things are, and it is. It is. It's crazy right now. The how General Assembly is crazy. But we had a win, so Pat wants to talk about a win. Thanks, Mark. So, um, yeah, I am a volunteer for the past two years with the Ohio Nuclear Free Network, and before that, I've been opposing nuclear power and nuclear weapons since 1981. But in the last um, almost a whole almost two years now we've been opposing this bill at the state house it was number 434 and it would uh, dip into our ohio taxpayers dollars uh, to support research and development on a new nuclear reactor well <laughs> i don't know how many of you want to put money into something that wall street won't support why do you think they're coming to ohio because they can't they could never get a loan for doing this so this bill, though, it would create an entirely, it would have created an entirely new Ohio authority, like an agency, and this authority would be put, uh, because it would be, have been put under the Department of Development, things would have been contracted out to Jobs Ohio. So people would have had no idea who was being paid, how much they were being paid, how deep they were diving into Ohio's treasury. Um, and still, you think you're starting a whole new big Ohio body. The bill is 14 pages long. And six of those 14 pages were about um, how to keep the board of this new authority in-house and away and out of the public. And so our, our group and our team and the Free Press published our 
our articles about it over the last couple of years and many others, you know, we, we rounded up with the network, with the Ohio Nuclear Free Network, we rounded up a lot of people, the Green Party, uh, the uh, Our Revolution Ohio, uh, many of you um, here came down and, and testified against this bill last week uh, because it had been heard in the House in the spring and it had already passed the Ohio House. So all it needed to do was pass out of this committee, pass the Senate. So what did they do? They waited till the lame duck to do this. And uh, yeah, when they could sneak it through real quickly. Uh, fortunately, um, um, well, we don't know for sure. They didn't, they apparently did not have the votes in the committee. Uh, and also the Senate is very busy with a lot of other bad bills. So this one was probably low priority, but um, <clears throat> We went down there um, the week after the proponents had been, had their chance to speak. This bill only had all together eight proponents. And six of those eight were potential beneficiaries of the bill. So <laughs> there were um, 30, 34 people sent in written testimony and 10 of us went down there and testified uh, against it including, I think, Sandy Bolzinius was there. Who else was here? Uh, Reverend Gary Whitty was there. Uh, um, uh, Jamie, you sent in testimony. Uh, so, but anyway, thanks to everybody. And I did want to put in a word, too, about, about nuclear power, because why was nuclear power needed? Too cheap to meter or too expensive to matter? Uh, it is a front for the weapons, and that is why it was needed, because this, the engineering is the same, the schooling is the same for nuclear power and weapons. Uh, not everyone who, want, who would want to study uh, nuclear engineering would want to be working on weapons. Uh, and then the funding overlaps uh, between, between many things. Uh, but nuclear power would never have gotten anywhere when we have a bat in the house. <laughs> um, without public subsidies, without the without providing insurance, uh, guarantees against uh, legal actions, and so forth, uh, would never uh, no, nuclear power could never have gotten off the ground. Now, how many people have heard that nuclear power is low carbon or carbon free? How many have heard this? <laughs> That's all you hear. Uh, but none of it is true. Nuclear power has a very high carbon footprint if you understand how nuclear power gets its fuel. It's from uranium mining and milling and, and refining and enrichment. And it's from building uh, from fuel fabrication. And where do they do this uranium mining? Uh, would it be on Native American and uh, um, uh, Latina, Latino lands on, on uh, low-income communities? Do you know that right here in Ohio, we have very high uh, uranium in our shale? Would qualify for being, uh, we could have a uranium mine almost under the state house. <laughs> uh, but, but why don't we? Well, because we have, there's a lot of political clout that, that, that is not happening. So all over the world, wherever uranium is mined, it is mined on uh, pretty much indigenous, pretty much all indigenous lands. So um, then the waste, there's no solution for the waste. It's never going to go away. There is nothing that can be done with it except try to prevent it from, from spreading. And that's going to be needed to be isolated for the next few thousand million years. And that's a real challenge. So we don't want any more nuclear waste generated. And we love our bats. <laughs> and um, so thank you all that have supported this effort that we have, uh, uh, the anti-nuclear effort. And thanks so much to the Free Press for supporting us, too. And to WGRN and Tim Chavez, especially. WGRN and WCRS are part of our public
media uh, complex, so please support WGRN and WCRS. We have one more speaker, then we're going to have some music and sort of, sort of informal conversations in the salon. Uh, David, and, uh, David and everybody else has set up a fire outside, so if you want to sit outside, enjoy yourselves outside, um, and just enjoy the food. We have plenty of food. So Ben, if you want to come up, and we're going to talk a little bit about housing and uh, how we uh, Columbus uh, or uh, Old First Presbyterian Church in particular uh, had an impact on uh, the crisis that is going on uh, last summer or last winter. So, uh, yeah, did nails and firewood. If anybody wants, to okay, yeah. If there. don't don't touch the firewood, uh, we got people taking care of that because uh, it it could be a little dangerous. We we reconstructed some stuff or deconstructed some stuff so don't you touch the firewood we'll get it taken care of my brother's out there right now so he's probably burning up the the next house probably daniel please tell me if there's a bad about to hit me in the back of the head um so my name is ben colburn um i would describe myself as just a guy that gives a fuck um so i know real titles um, but this year I was involved in a project that started in this church, um, right where you are, it's like some of the seats where you are right now. We ran a warming station. Um, this started at the very beginning of the year, January. Um, I got involved early February because I was living a block away and I'm nosy. And um, so it was first collective um collective people with gary Reedy that started um started doing doing this here um so it started very slowly with one guy um one guy that just one guy named michael and sometimes there were more volunteers than uh than there were people that stayed here um we uh we ended up um figuring out like how to do a warming station as we were doing it. Um, most of us were, like didn't have any qualifications or anything like that. We just knew about a bit about homelessness and trauma-informed care and harm reduction. Um, so uh, it what started very small ended up growing. And I guess we ended up being the uh, the what were the we were the last one in Columbus that was open. Yeah. So March 29th. March 29th, exactly. So uh and we did this all totally grassroots. Even the church for all people that got big city money stopped before you guys. Yeah. We did this all grassroots. This was all like just people giving a fuck. Um we knew that we knew that homelessness was on the rise because of COVID. Um at any given time, there's probably like two thousand estimated homeless people uh, in Columbus, very likely more than that, because there are people living in their cars. I was one of them um, twice in my life. Uh, there are people living also in encampments. More on that later. But um, we, uh, yeah, we were, we, we, grew, we grew slowly. Um, but we we realize like if you treat people like people, you just sit down and talk to them. They're not homeless. We can't bother them. They're people. You just sit down and talk to them and listen to them. They will tell you a lot. They'll actually tell you how you can coach them sometimes. And this is really, really important if you want to understand houselessness. Um, You've got to come at it from a trauma-informed approach because it pretty much like at least 50% of the people in this room have some sort of trauma, just by stats, maybe even more. Um, you, if you're on the street, that's a trauma in and of itself. Um, often it's compound trauma, like things that people have done to them early in their lives, and it's built and built and built until they're out on the street for whatever reason. Um, so often they're hiding in plain sight. We just go right by them. 
um, we were we would just realize when talking to people that like there was there was just not enough being done by the city by the shelter board um, to do right by them. Um, so the city of Columbus's policy is basically uh, just herd people into shelters and then try to get them rehoused that way. But this is not like a meet them where they are kind of approach most of the time. There are a lot of people who don't want to be in shelters because shelters can be violent places. They can be, um, there's a lot of theft and uh, many people just end up like falling through the cracks again and again because they they have to abide by some of these like rules that they're not ready to abide by. So evidence-based, we know that the way to solve houselessness is to do a housing first model. Um, this is so important going forward in this city that we get we get uh, our politicians on board with it, um, not the continuum of care approach, which is just like people have to go through various barriers before they get into housing. Housing first, housing is a human right. You cannot have a stability until you have a place that's home. So that's what this warming station was for a bit to some of these people. We realized when we had more people that we could do more and um, my former partner ended up basically funding the whole thing herself. Uh, we got harm reduction supplies. Um, we provided food, of course, the shelter, like these basic human rights, uh, rights, but we were also providing community. And that community itself became like an intentional community. We found out that peer support uh, could often could often help out where um, you know inform our formal support couldn't like if you've got people battling addiction and houselessness they all know like all this shit they know how how the the city treats them they know how um, what it takes to survive like that and they often have like. It's, it's, it was funny to see like some people could be completely oblivious about how to help themselves, but they would have excellent advice for other people. And so the, the group as therapists, which later turned into a community, was a beautiful thing to watch. It happened naturally. So anyway, it, we ended up, yeah, the, the camp started uh, on the 29th. And that was from leaving here, we brought this intentional community that wanted to come with us over to East Mount Street. And that camp became Camp Shameless. Um, now, Columbus's policy on camps, much the same as just regular in-house, but they've got to evict them. Um, so generally they come in, the Department of Development comes in with the police and uh, gives, gives the camp a month uh, notice of eviction, and at that time, uh, they will come in and bulldoze and uh, completely disrupt and displace people. Um, that's that's Columbus's policy right now. We worked with this camp to try and change that, and we actually did have some kind of impact on that because Columbus is now we have we have people that. Um, are taking it more seriously and looking more progressively at what we can do. It's too little too late right now, um, as far as I'm concerned, and many other activists are concerned, but hopefully what we did could push things in the right direction, because what we did was create kind of an autonomous space um, where people could be themselves, could be an intentional community, and we somehow got the police to leave us alone so that it became even a safe use site. It wasn't about it wasn't about like drugs all the time. We just met people where they were. And we couldn't like refuse them just because they were using. So is it <laughs> am I out of time? <laughs> okay, sure. Um but 
I think this is, I think the model that we did, we had, um, I, I call it the embedded model. Um, we had activists live in tents with, with the unhoused and do frontline care work. Uh, this was, this was something that I think led to it being successful because it was meeting people where they were still. Um, if we, we never had any overdoses, we never had any like major, major incidents. I'm still proud of that. Um, but this was, um, it was a wild, wild experience of uh, being embedded there. Um, it really felt like a big family, like starting here, but then going out to that camp felt like, you know, these are people that have each other's backs. They know and understand one another. And we're going to, we're going to stick up for our rights to be housed. And at the end of that camp, the city put them up in uh, a, a pilot program. So they're all in a budget tail, like way out on the east side, um, which they will apparently stay there until uh, the city helps them find housing. I know one person already has housing, um, one of my good friends from this camp. And um, he's successfully been in his house for two months um, after being homeless on and off for about 18 years. So it's still, um, yeah, it's still very new and it's an adjustment period for him. Um, one gets used to living on the street. One gets used to that mentality, being in survival mode all the time. Uh, and it can be difficult to transition into, well, now I've actually got a house. Now I've got, um, you know, I can have responsibilities. I can build on this. But that's that's where we need to keep meeting people where we are. And I think um, there's much to be said about the embedded model starting off because it it we do camps, which the city is hostile to, but we've got them to relax it. If you do it in a certain way, like I wrote down here, like be clean, be great neighbors, have your mutual aid go on, um, do harm reduction, build community support if you can. And um, for me, and I think other people, like one of the main, one of the main helpful things was, um, you know, this dispatch article that ended up really humanizing our people. Um, that was one of the goals was to just humanize our people and not just see them as this other. And so like we, we intentionally chose a space that um, people would see on East Mountain. We were hidden. Um, it was right down the block from a police substation. <laughs> so they could watch this and they did. Um, but they didn't really they didn't really mess with us. And at one point I found out that um, they were instructed by the city to treat our tents as structures so they, they couldn't enter them without warrants. Um, it was it was both really cool and really inconvenient in one situation. But um, I, I think we were being viewed as like a test model. And there is there's definitely validity in that model with volunteers that are able to do this kind of service, do this kind of mutual aid, meet people where they are. Uh, it catches people falling through the cracks of other types of housing. There are many different types of transitional housing, and then the people that are not in them or don't want to be in them, I think camps are a good humane idea, but you know. There is a way to do a correct, there is a way to do a camp. Um, and then there's a way to totally, you know, become a target for police as a camp. Um, so I'm into helping people like try to um, keep their camps as long as they can, um, if they're not doing any other options. Um, we basically need to stop the camp sweeps and uh, Columbus has got to, figure itself out um, for new types of housing. Uh, we just had this 
we just had this what two hundred million dollar bond package um, passed for affordable housing, and that's just like that's a drop in the bucket. Like luxury housing um, over the last ten years has increased fifty two percent, and affordable housing has increased, uh, has increased like two or three percent. So you know you the evidence of of Columbus getting you know becoming more and more unequal is there in our face every day. So. Um, I would urge all of you to, um, you know, try and think about new ways of, of homelessness and of confronting it and appreciate you letting me speak. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Ben. And thanks to everybody coming out. Now, uh, we're going to have some music and now the salon continues. Informal conversation, please. Please take some time to go walk and explore the church. This congregation is the oldest congregation in Franklin County. The first public high, uh, public school and first public hospital came out of this congregation. They weren't here. They were on, in Franklinton at that time. Louis Sullivan. There's some history on the walls over here if you'd be interested in sort of meandering around there. Sanctuary has great acoustics. So go in there and sing if you'd like to. But and now we're going to have a little music in our background and sort of feeling good about being in a salon for the holiday time. All right. Enjoy. Give greetings to each other and know that 2022 has been eh. So 2023 is going to be better. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming out. And we'll uh, continue talking as we go. OK, thank you. And thanks, guys, for coming out and playing some music.